Haita, uh, one there, Hiromi Yaibin, uh, Craig Green Ronin, a new fifth season role playing game, Yanya, uh, Wataya Uri Kancha, uh, I'm Hiromi Kota, they, them, uh, one of the writers and developers for the fifth season RPG, uh, that was Uchina Guchi that I was just speaking, the indigenous language of, uh, Okinawa, uh, one of the indigenous languages, uh, just sort of doing my part to keep my people's languages alive with me, uh, is uh, Tanya De Pass, one of my fellow uh, uh, developers and super awesome person in general. Uh, and I'll let uh, her uh, introduce herself. Hey, y'all. I'm Tanya. Uh, thank you, Hermi, for uh, introducing me. I, I'm i not great at introductions, so hi, it's me. I've been working on this along with Romy. Um, but, you know, shout out to Romy for doing all of the hard work and amazing uh corralling of developers which we all know is a hard thing uh but yeah i'm working on this glad to be here glad that the book is almost done and we can have a physical thing in hand so but yeah i'm your internet ne'er do well in the rpg industry (laughs) just sort of like a real quick thing uh to uh introduce uh fifth season and the broken earth trilogy for folks who are watching this because they like green running uh, running uh or the age system and they are just now learning about uh fifth season um fifth season role-playing game is adapted from nk jemison's uh best-selling sci-fi novels the broken earth trilogy uh the books and in particular its setting the stillness mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people uh, it's a harsh land where the threat of Father Earth sending an earthquake or volcano to your hometown is always in the back of everyone's mind. Uh, literally, because everyone in the stillness has a seismic sensory organ uh, that's just sensitive enough to give them a running start. Some people have stronger abilities. Uh, we'll talk about them in a little bit. The stillness is a place of injustice, world of haves and have-nots, where the wealthy have geothermal power, hydroelectric power, plumbing, refrigerators, and the poor, well, they don't have any of that. Uh, Mm. But regardless of where on the socioeconomic ladder your characters are, uh, they have a hometown in the stillness uh, that's called a calm, uh, and it plays a vital role in their identity and chances of survival. Uh, True. Although it was just, I as you were talking, I was like, "Ooh, that's a little hitting a little too close to home." It wasn't when the book was written, but now, ooh, yeah, just just a little too close to home. Some days, <laughs> the stillness and the calms are are interesting, and it makes me really think, especially with how we've seen people. There's not a play way to say it, basically degenerate their social mores over the last three years and kind of see that same have have not mentality but in terms of what's been going on in reality in the last three years and uh it's interesting and i'm curious to see how people kind of run with that and play with it once the book is in their hands yeah um and i i will say that um despite the kind of um grim uh preface or introduction to the stillness that i uh gave a little bit ago there is a decent amount of hope in the setting um Mm -hmm. like survival for most people is a challenge it's difficult but uh at the same time um it's very much focused on being part of a community being part of a calm Mm -hmm. uh and like surviving and prospering together and like building towards uh, a future where um, everyone is at least okay. Yeah. And that's, and that's what I love about it. You know, both the books and the game is that you have to collaborate. You can't just kind of be like, well, got mine deuces. It's going to end badly for you. So uh, that's what I do love about the setting and the game and I really hope people also take that lesson to heart. Not like we're making an empathy game or it's like, here, play this game and be a better person. But to really think about the fact that storytelling and sitting at the table is collaborative, but also the gist of the game and the book and the world is you got to work together in order to survive the really bad things. 
and like that uh, idea and that concept of needing to pull together uh, is baked into the the game at like a core level. Mm -hmm. uh, like as as players, you create your calm before you create your characters. Yep. Um, that's that's obviously not true in the quick start because that's a lot of rules and it wouldn't be quick if we did it there <laughs> it'd just be a yeah. start not a quick start <laughs> yeah. um but like you sort of like uh figure out what events uh have recently shaped the calm and from there it's how do your characters fit into the calm not how do your characters the how how do your characters kick ass in the world and conquer uh, people who are just in their own homes, minding their own fucking business? Uh, what? I don't no mean... colonialism? What? <laughs> colonialism thought. in my fantasy RPG? Yes. Since the 70s. Yes. And <laughs> we're changing that now. Oops. Yeah. You let all the brown people in. Sorry, not sorry. Um. <laughs> No, I, I love that because, I mean, you and I both played TTRPGs a long time, and most things are, how much stuff can I get? Who can I kill? Sometimes you go and do things, and you have no idea if you're actually not the bad person. Um, You know, you don't, the moral quandary isn't often there. It's like, look, I found this small, helpless creature. I'm going to kill it. I got gold and XP moving on, and this is like, no, no, you have to think about where you live and protecting where you live and the people where you live before you think about who am I as a character in the setting. Yeah. Um, and that that's... Uh, I don't think that's codified in the rules. However, it is a thing that I hit on a lot. <laughs> uh, like, in, in the quick start, there's a sidebar uh, entitled don't start no shit because i mean <laughs> you know what's funny it's that that made me think of nk jemison like immediately i'm like yep that's an orism super light spoilers uh for the quick start it it's not gonna ruin anything uh if you're a player and you're listening to it but if you're a player and you're listening to it and you don't want any sort of spoilers whatsoever uh i guess fast forward like 30 seconds uh the uh quick start adventure takes place entirely within the calm like there's no reason for you to leave players are players and they can do whatever they want but uh there's no actual reason for people to leave which means any fight you get into is with your fucking neighbors if you kill oh. someone their family is your next door neighbors or across the street or wherever you're gonna run into them again Ooh. don't start no shit <laughs> okay so when are we going to play the quick start because <laughs> i feel like people need to think about that in terms of digital neighbors online but also just of i love it i love that you don't have to go anywhere because oftentimes even quick start adventures have you wandering hither and yon. And I'm like, why? I want to get to know where I am right now. Mm -hmm. But also there's going to be a consequence if you do murder someone. And there's a consequence overall because if, if resources are scarce and I kill my neighbor for their water, their food, whatever, one, everybody's going to know you did it. And two, what to me and it's like now i'm sorry gm brain kicked in i was like ooh, the moral quandary i could put players through for doing this this is also me getting like super excited real time because the book <laughs> is closer and closer to reality um i just love that though because again we don't normally see that when it comes to ttrpgs where you wind up you are are not trapped is not the word i'm thinking of you're enclosed in an area to a learn the system learn the game but also it's going to make you think early on before you get the full book mm -hmm. yeah um 
And one of the things I like uh, in just adventure design in general is when people include uh, lasting consequences for their actions. Like mm -hmm. the end of uh, an adventure scenario, whatever, shouldn't just be here's some money and experience, get out of here. Uh, the, the world is unchanged because like um, nothing exists in a vacuum. Oh, absolutely not. Um, it was something I actually explored uh, in a show that I DM'd because I, I tried to put the moral quandary of you all have never lost. No one has ever pushed you. So I'm going to make you think about the fact that you're basically demigods at this point. <laughs> and all the things that you've done since day one, it has affected people. And now those chickens are coming home to roost. Nice. Uh, we're supposed to talk about the game, but I want to know more about that. <laughs> um, TLDR, because I also I do want to focus on the season, but you know, I DM'd the season arrivals and you know, I I I've always been thinking about it since the, like the last few seasons of, you know, at a certain point you are very powerful, and you know, also kind of thinking that was the fifth season because eventually, if your con gets enough resources or you have an origin and that origin gets trained, gets sent out to the fulcrum, what have you, you have someone who is incredibly powerful in your group, and this is a group of adventurers who who has now gone to Avernus, they've gone to all these other places. And there's been no repercussion for all the things like literally having a building come to life and fight people. You know how many people probably died during this fight? But yet, it's like, well, we fixed it. And I'm like, but but people. So I, I put the moral quandary and made them think in character, are we actually doing any good here? And like, even if it turns out that the answer is yes, that they're doing good, Mm -hmm. At what cost? And can they pay it? Are they willing to? Yep. And uh, and that's kind of where we we left it. And I, I think there's great potential for that in this season, especially with the quick start adventure, because, you know, you're basically at home when you run this. And there should be repercussions, especially if you take that quick start session or sessions and bring it forward into a full campaign. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, sort of uh, drawing on that and uh, geeking out about save, saving, geeking out about uh, general adventure design and the cool stuff that you've done uh, for uh, later when we're not recording. I guess. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, how how did you get involved in this? Uh, like you you were already on board before I was, so uh, I have no um, idea. <laughs> so uh, Green Ronin actually reached out and said, "Hey, you know this is something we like to do. We know that you've done design because I'd worked with them previously on a few other projects." And they were like, "Are you interested?" And I was like, "Yes, but also just for disclosure, you know that I'm a friend with NK Jemison. Is this okay? I don't want it to be weird." They're like, "No, no, no. She's." She's involved. She has final say so on everything. Like, okay, cool. Because they also were very cognizant of, you know, we as a studio and, and a group of developers, there's no people of color that are on staff. They always have hired freelancers. But we also don't want to do a disservice to the book, the person, the setting, the world. And so both a majority of the writers... And uh, the artists are people of color. And a lot of the writers are people that I was able to reach out to that I knew did great work. I love their design work and their writing. And we're able to put together a really great group of people that are fans of the work and are doing it justice, but not in the, oh my God, it's N.K. Jemison. It's the, I understand and respect the world that she built. And I want to reflect that in the pages of this book. Uh, for for. Uh, for me, I I hadn't actually read the uh, uh, the novels uh, when the um, when the call went out. Uh, a bunch of folks had told me that I should read it and that they they were very much up my alley. Um, but it wasn't until uh, the call went out that I'm like, okay, now I need to read them. Uh, 
and fucking binged them uh, in like a day because uh, they're great. Uh, and it's a possibly a perennially timely uh, um, uh, set of novels. Like, just kept hitting me where I live. Uh, yeah. Um, it was it was hard, but you know, there's always been the issue. Not even the issue. There's been the systemic and societal have have not since time began. As one person figured out how to like cook a bear or a deer or something, and they had fresh meat, and other people didn't. This is not a problem that has gone away in all this time. Yeah. Um that ah. uh yeah, that uh sort of uh makes me think of a comparison that is going to seem kind of weird uh at first, uh but I kind of feel like this stillness uh, in terms of uh, tone and uh, a lot of the sort of um, facets that shape the world uh, have a fair amount in common with cy uh, cyberpunk, like just the general genre of cyberpunk. Like you have a world that was heavily uh, colonized uh, and like, um, sort of brought under uh, a particular way of thought, a particular school of thought. And then uh, afterwards, a uh, capitalist came along and then just completely took over. Uh, and now there's this huge uh, uh, stark contrast between people living in uh, the equatorials, people living in the equatorial comms uh, specifically, uh, and people everywhere else. And so like, there is this tension, this like kind of uh, fight the man um, uh, feel like it's not imperative across the uh, stillness, but it does kind of make you want to fight. Um, yeah, I actually went back and reread the books because I have a terrible memory um, and rereading the first book. I'd forgotten about the fulcrum and a lot of other stuff. And the fulcrum and the academy for the origins just made me really think about that, especially how our protagonist is treated. She's literally sold off as a kid and tricked, you know, given up by her parents. And I was just like, ooh, feels. But also, wow, the academy is really rude. People. So I I can't wait for people to eventually get to see more of the fulcrum. And uh, or I'm wondering if people would just create their own version of the fulcrum once the book is out. <laughs> I don't know whether I don't know how sure ah mm. <laughs> how much we can say about that. I mean, you can always edit it out. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So uh, I know that uh, the the core book is going out first. Uh, there there is going to be. Uh, Ten Rings, which is focused on uh, origins and guardians and the fulcrums, uh, and there's going to be a delay between uh, when the quick start uh, comes out and people can immediately start playing uh, the core book, and then uh, Ten Rings. So I have to assume that people are going to uh, uh, homebrew their own and just be like. Well, I I read the books too. Let's do this, uh, and it's going to be wild to see that. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm interested to see how people play it, uh, and also worried with how people play it because again, you know, Nora is a black woman living in the U.S., and there are themes in the book that are very topical. Yet we know that not all RPG players will handle it sensitively. So there is that concern, at least when it comes to actual plays. We have, and and Chris mentioned this earlier when we were having another discussion of the hard part with any of this is that once the book is out, you can't do a lot with it. You can't tell people what to do. We can go, here are these themes. Please be mindful. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, once they've paid their sixty bucks, 
yeah. Uh, it's the unfortunate uh, facts of the uh, tabletop RPG industry, or I guess probably just games in general. Yeah, um, yeah. But I, I'm, I'm excited. I'm excited to see what people do with it, and, um, you know, and eventually run this for friends and and see what happens. Yeah, when you mentioned uh, when are we going to play, uh, like I don't know, like ten minutes back or, or however, what what is time? I'm like, when are we going to play? <laughs> uh, yeah, because we'll have the kick, <laughs> we'll have the quick start in hand fairly soon. So, yeah, um, and uh, and I meant to address this earlier. Um, maybe future Hiromi will uh, cut and put this forward uh spoilers i'm not going to it's funnier if i do it this way uh yes you can play uh origins uh right off the bat uh but just ferals until 10 rings so uh one of the characters uh in the quick start is an origin uh not not out uh because that has so many uh implications and concerns uh not that being a closeted origin doesn't have those uh they're just differently complicated yeah and you know i'm not sure how you've thought about this or parsed it and i it's one of the things i've not ever really asked nora about mm -hmm. but the the correlation unintentional or intentional i'm not sure correlation between hiding who you are to survive and being since you said out it made me think of what do you do if someone out you as an origin and that kind of parallel between being a, a queer person and l hiding to survive because the game is about survival at the core of it yeah that that was one of that was one of the things that uh, kept hitting me uh, when I was reading the books. I'm like, hmm. <laughs> You're like, hmm. Wow, ow, that, that was my heart right there, ow. Yeah, because like, uh, I there's probably a better term for it, but like the one that uh, usually sticks in my head is um, invisible marginalized people where like mm -hmm. there is the possibility of uh going undetected of passing or uh however you want to describe uh that uh interaction within society and like it's very fucking different uh from uh being out from being open with uh, who you are even if uh the other people are hostile uh yeah. like it yeah no it just fucking hits differently and it's yeah i'm i'm i and this is like just my pipe dream that i hope when people get the book or the quick start that we see the most queer most you know brilliant stories that come out of this because there's so many parallels and again it's also in how you read it in your life experience, coloring what you see and what you read. Because mm -hmm. um, for me, I'm like, so my comm will, will probably be like, you know, a, a queer commune. And, you know, it is what it is. And if people don't like it, I don't care. <laughs> yeah, I, I really hope we see just tons of uh qtpoc uh uh actual plays and people uh having fun with it because like it's a queer and trans uh person of color like i'm i want i want more of us uh, i want more rep i want uh things to be just better all around <laughs> yeah i really i mean we I'm sure we could diverge and talk <laughs> about just that for like two hours. But, you know, the fact that we're getting this adaptation into an RPG, the fact that the trilogy itself is, you know, set Yugo history. And Nora and Kay Jemison is such a brilliant world builder 
because how many times do we get to play in the sandbox of a setting and a world where it's so well done, it's so fleshed out, you've got great characters already. And it's like here, hopefully you will get, you will have a great experience, you'll think about these things. Because I, I don't know how you like run games or DM or GM, but I also try to have it be more narrative and more collaborative, and that is mm-hmm. how this is built. And so I'm super excited to just get in there and run amok with it. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, my uh, weekly uh, Scion game uh, is just glorious amounts of chaos for everyone involved uh, because they're. It's a whole world. You get to uh, pull at what threads uh, you want. And so, like, uh, I know where I would like personally to uh, start in the stillness and like how I would like uh, the game to uh, start off. Uh, I have zero expectation that (laughs) that will happen. Or even if it does happen, that it will stay like that. Uh, there's there's tons to do. <laughs> um, yeah, but you know that just means oh no, we'll have to have super long campaigns of the season. <laughs> oh no, what will we do? Such suffering. Oh uh, oh darn oh darn, what will we do? Um, sort of tailing off of that, uh, if. We were starting a game uh, right meow. Uh, mm. Where in the stillness uh, would you like it set? Um, pretty close to water. I would like it to be like not not right on the water, not a beachfront, not a but you know close enough to where we can kind of have water and come back and process it, but. Not so close that the calm would get washed away. <laughs> um, I know the proper word, but it is, of course, not coming to me because we are having this chat. Um, but, you know, very... And not even super dependent on the water because um, it's not fresh in my mind, but I can't remember if it's mostly still or still water. We're saying stillness. If it's salt water, fresh water, or if we want to process water, I don't remember. Yeah, I think for the most part, uh, folks have freshwater sources, but how reliable their access to it is. Uh, yeah. It's the stillness. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, being close to fresh water, but also thinking heavily about how that affects the status of the calm, how often people may try to raid because we are near a uh, precious resource, things like mm-hmm. that. Yeah. I hadn't thought about it in terms like that question in terms of, um, uh, features uh i had thought about it more like uh geographical but like uh that what what's nearby is uh extremely important and interesting because like mm-hmm. if you're near an imperial road you have easy trade and transit um but but also people have easy transit to you and you might not necessarily like everyone uh, coming to your town and messing with your business, uh, especially if, you know, they're hostile. <laughs> um, uh, I think for me, I have a kind of a weird answer for a weird uh, semi-wholesome reason. <laughs> okay. Uh so I I really like the idea of living uh in one of the coastals um uh or rather playing a character who's living in one of the coastals mm-hmm. uh that and and for folks unfamiliar with the uh um the the regions especially because the coastals don't get super explored um they they get hit with storms and tsunamis and like they, they're like constantly being destroyed and rebuilt. Like it's a tropical 
environment. So like there's tons of rainfall. And so it's, it's hard to have a calm intact long enough uh, for it to become permanent with like stone walls and whatnot. But mm-hmm. uh, lumber is super accessible uh, and you can just chop down trees and build yourself a calm made out of wood in a couple months. Uh, and the reason why that uh, appeals to me for a weird a uh, wholesome reason is because uh, for part of my childhood, uh, I grew up uh, on Okinawa, uh, on Uchina, uh, and we got hit with fucking typhoons like five to ten times a year. And oh wow! It it's just a fucking thing. Like that's just that's just how life is. Um, and the the wholesome bit is, my folks were always off at work, but. When there was a typhoon, we're all at home because you can't fucking go anywhere. <laughs> it's dangerous uh, outside. Uh, uh, so like the idea of uh, a stormy environment feels like home, which is super weird to anyone who's not an Islander. <laughs> okay. Uh, but yeah, like I, I want to do it. Uh, who knows if I'll have time to be a player in a game sort of related to that. Uh, if we we were starting up a game uh, just now, what use cast would you want to play? Like, <laughs> mm. that's rough because some of them, I, it's weird because I, I'm going to say strong back, but there's mm-hmm. also like in the back of my mind, especially because I've been talking about the game so much in the last couple of days is the connotation of being a strong back as a black woman. Mm. But it's also kind of a, a, a class skill structure that I gravitate to at the table, like being the fighter, being the strong one. So there's that internal conflict, but, Probably strong back to try out first. Um, and I will stay a million miles away from Breeder. <laughs> so for folks unfamiliar with fifth season's cast system, uh the, the casts of the stillness, uh there there are a variety of them. Uh I guess salient right now is uh the breeder uh use cast. And the idea with that is that they they are what it says in the name, uh folks. Uh, kind of in charge of and responsible for um, maintaining the comms population uh, partly through uh, making babies, but also through um, arranging partnerships and uh, between folks also uh, raising the next uh, generation and making sure that kids are taken care of. Uh, so like it's, it's not a cast that's nothing but, but sex workers and it's not even necessarily sex workers but it is something to be approached delicately uh we we have sidebars to to help with that but you you should players should uh treat it delicately because it's it is a very particular uh concept with the potential for things to go not well. Yeah. Yeah. And this is where session zero comes in super handy. And uh, I believe there is a section in the book also giving tips on how to deal with a lot of these heavy topics and subjects that are themes in the book. And to, to to return back uh, from that very important tangent, uh, I'm kind of torn uh, between um, innovator and lorist because they're basically like the two big parts of uh, my brain and fascination is uh, science, this sort of like uh, constructed um, concept of uh, knowledge and uh, how that shapes people's perceptions of the world and technology. But then there's also um, oral traditions, uh, traditional knowledge, cultural knowledge, 
Uh, and both of those are super important to me because like if we only relied on official science, uh, so many indigenous cultures would at best, at best, uh, have all of their cultural differences uh, sort of filed away. Uh, and that is best case scenario with that approach. Uh, but for folks unaware, uh, the uh, uh, Shimanchu people, the uh, Luchu, uh, the people of the Ryukyu Islands, uh, we got hit with a fucking cultural genocide when Japan uh, decided that they needed to be imperial. Uh, I have super complicated feelings about the Meiji Emperor. Uh, and uh, yeah, no, I, I don't need to go into it. I'm not gonna, but cultural knowledge is super important because there's a lot of stuff that will never make it to a history book uh, mm -hmm. because of who's writing them. Uh, and there's a lot of uh, even like technological uh, knowledge that gets lost when people are concentrating on uh, progress for progress's sake. I, I remember an archaeologist found uh, like this sort of like uh, cone cone shaped object and people, the archaeologist like, we have no idea what this is. Uh, it's, it's made out of bone. It looks like this, but we have no idea. And they showed it to a leather worker and the leather worker's like, Oh yeah, no, that's that's an edging tool. You, you'd use that to like um uh seal up the pores on the edge of cut leather. That's sort of like this knowledge that gets passed down along more of a artistic community, more of a uh uh maker community. And that's not always valued uh by uh the intelligentsia. Uh so yeah. <laughs> Pulling back to the actual conversation, like lorist, uh, innovator, science, uh, um, cultural knowledge, they're both really important. Uh, yeah. Or you could do a little column A, a little column B. Yeah. I mean, again, once the book is out of our hands. <laughs> oh no, and stop people because you a surprise you can do more than one thing. Yeah, um, I probably would go with Lorist on my second character unless I try strong back and really hate it because again, it's all going to depend on who's at the table. Uh, it's <laughs> uh. I've I've been kind of like head down uh working on the books long enough that I just kind of forgot how interesting and fun it is that we we have these use casts, we have like these kind of archetypes that you can be, but they're not like D D classes. You don't have to have these five in your group uh right. i don't think we have an official term for a group of people just group uh, yeah uh but like you don't have to be like we have to have <laughs> fighter cleric yeah. rogue uh uh wizard like you know no it what what do people want to play what what parts of the stillness engage them well like what what are they excited about doing um and like having a mix uh is very helpful but like you you can you could play a game where everyone's a lorist uh just you could <laughs> but then if another calm invades you might all die yeah uh but hey that's role playing <laughs> it, it's true uh and and also if you're uh if everyone, if every one of the player characters is um, an easy, easily replaceable, uh, uh, group, yeah, then like if a season hits, you're you're gonna be struggling. Um, yeah, 
but I I do like the idea that it's not there's not an ideal uh group makeup. Yeah, and and I think people struggle with that in other RPGs where again they have the classic I need X, Y, and Z archetype. And if we don't have it, then we're going to fail. Or they feel like they must have this, they must have this. And the adventures often support that kind of group building versus you have to think about your group and your comm and your community first with this. Mm -hmm. And you could have three Loris and two Strongbacks. Cool. But you don't have to do it that way. And uh, for sort of clarity slash uh, pulling back the curtain uh, a little bit on uh, the lore of use casts uh, in in the stillness. In the books, uh, in the in the novels, um, there's this continuous suggestion uh, and implication that there are seven major use casts. Uh, Five of them are very well covered and supported, uh, and uh, like all of the imperial uh, lores, like the like breeder, innovator, strongback, uh, resistance, uh, leadership. Those th- those are definitely in. Um, Guardian is also one of them, uh, which is generally kind of shoved over to the side because they're fucking terrifying, uh, and people don't want to think about them that much. Uh, mm-hmm. Origins are actually the seventh and never, never officially acknowledged as such because they're feared and hated uh, and no one wants to acknowledge how important they are to society's survival. Um, And like that, that's something I only learned because of being on on this project. Um, I, I don't know how much that will impact anything because like it it's hard to think about the stillness as like a whole within the game because your people you're you're living in a calm your your calm is what is important to you uh right. and like you're you're not trying to hit level 30 and take over the world or reshape it in your image. Like you're just a person. Uh, yep. And you know, live your life, can improve the world as best you can. But at the end of the day, you're constrained in how big of an impact you can have. Um, which is not to say that, you can't do big cool things just that it's not generally where the focus uh of the setting is because it's there's a lot about um community building finding your people uh um building um relationships and maintaining them strengthening uh your bonds within a community and making sure that as many people uh, uh, near you, as many of your neighbors make it uh, to the next season and ideally beyond. Yeah. And I keep repeating this a lot, but I feel like it's important is that the game is about surviving. And while it's sometimes cool to have the big damn hero moment in other games, that big damn hero moment could get your calm ruined or destroyed or get people you care about killed. Mm-hmm. And not enough, we don't want people to have that moment, but having that selfish spotlight will not serve the same purpose in this game and in this setting and in this world that it would in, say, other systems, other other things. Because in that moment, everybody wants to be cool. I want to be a demigod and be get to level 20. Cool. But what are you going to do with all this power now? And I think Mm -hmm. having to realize your place in society in the in the stillness and in your calm will make people think a lot more. Not that people don't think at the table, because I can hear someone making that implication now. That is not (laughs) what I'm saying. But be more judicious in what you do, why you do it, and how you go about achieving goals and making sure you're not running off to have the Leroy Jenkins or the big hero moment. 
Because <laughs> you know Sorry. someone will watch this and be like, I, what are you trying to say? Now I'm just imagining Leroy Jenkins in the stillness and how terrible it would go for everyone. Uh, it's like uh, we were talking about uh, much earlier where like nothing exists in a vacuum and with fifth season you kind of have to confront that you kind of have to make your peace with that uh and decide how you fit into it um and one thing that i want to complicate just because uh i don't want to limit uh player options or how people think about the game you can live on the road you can uh ha find find a new community you can have a community that sort of travels with you uh you don't have to be fixed to a specific location uh especially if that calm doesn't suit you for whatever reason and it's like not safe for you or whatever um so you're not like locked into that permanently uh and if if you do something horrible maybe you're gonna get forced out of the calm anyways um yeah but like the the idea that you find your people you find your family uh and you make a life uh as a, a community as a group as a com where wherever that is whatever that looks like um is important uh both both in the game and and in the novels like the the novels are all about uh uh finding family uh some in in many cases literally but also uh found family um yep. and like learning what it is to be part of uh a community as part of like uh a group of people larger than just you uh yep. regardless of how much power you have <laughs> yeah and you know there's also about grief and motherhood and and learning when to let go and learning how to move forward because mm -hmm. i don't want to say move on because anyone who's had a major loss knows that it's never simple as just moving on but moving forward and still getting up out of bed the next day mm -hmm. and and in the calm you know you can't there's no real chance from at least what we see in the beginning you know, learning to grieve, learning to still put one foot in front of the other. But also, you know, what happens when you do have that selfish moment of this is what I want and this is what I need and I'm going to get it. Yeah. Like, one way or the other, you're, you're dealing with the larger impacts of how like how, how things uh end up feeling how things end up working out for you uh like if if you decide that uh you and um the current uh leader of your com uh cannot work together and one of you has to go regardless of which one of you goes that's that's going to reshape life there yeah and you know and just like when families fall apart or people get divorced there's that kind of well this has changed this is a new day and how do we survive because unlike well i can't even say that because you know like sometimes relationships fall apart and it's a major shift in in how people are able to survive and things like that um, but if one person leaves, that means the comm falls apart, which hopefully no one gets to a position where their whole comm will fall apart if one person leaves. But uh you know, you have to you have to really think about the consequences of your actions. You know, that's why I love the the quick start adventure of don't start no shit. But you know, overall, at the end of the day, I'm I'm super excited for the book the game and for people to just dive into the world and you know i, I was on a call earlier with chris premis and i feel like the the game that people will get doesn't 
you don't have to know the stillness inside and out to play it. You don't have to know the book inside and out because we don't want to discourage anyone from getting it if they don't know the books. But what I hope happens is that people that aren't like into like sci-fi or or the kind of genre because I, I I I hesitate to put it in a specific genre either. <laughs> yeah. Um but you know the books that Nora writes, I hope that people that normally are more on the RPG side that maybe have never heard of a season, but maybe they've heard of Nora, will then go and pick up the books and read the trilogy. And that the game will reach people who may have never thought about rolling dice before. Yeah. Um, and I think uh, sort of like the focus on community uh, will help with that a lot because um, I I think I've done no research on this, so I could be horrendously wrong. Uh, but I think that there's like a decent number of people out there who have problems engaging with uh role playing games because mm -hmm. they're not they're not interested in like the epic adventure like the uh swords and uh sorcery and, and all of uh that kind of uh genre um and i think fifth season uh like it it's generally smaller focus uh will speak more to like those kinds of folks who um aren't necessarily about epic struggles and want to see things that are a little bit uh closer to home uh a little bit more familiar and um that at the, at the end of the day victory is not just survival but taking care of other people um, because the, the past few years, we, we have needed, uh, community, uh, and like, uh, webs, like intersectional webs of, uh, marginalized folks have like connected with each other to try and help each other, like help each other, like help us through just bonkers uh um years and it's like this this is great can we keep this going can we have more of this uh and i i want more of that and i could do with a game that's just like no but that's that's the that's the game <laughs> yep I, you know, having played, you know, other games, other systems, basically been playing role playing games since, you know, I could probably not since I could roll dice because I probably would have tried to eat them as a child. <laughs> um, but, you know, since I was a, a young kid and grown up with you no know, certain expectations, certain tropes, it's also going to just be refreshing to do something different and have the aim of the game not be winner takes all conquer everything and take everyone's money and gold and kill all that come in front of you yeah um so hi i'm tanya i've worked on this game but again please give all praise and and kudos to Hiromi and all the writers and the devs and everyone else and all the artists once you see the fantastic art that's coming the 24th go back it on backer kit get whatever edition fits your pocketbook as for me, you can find me on the internet everywhere I for tier. Um, what else? I do a lot of things. I'm making a TTRPG of my own. It's getting there. It will be out at some point this year uh, into the motherlands. And if you want to see it in action, go watch all four seasons on my YouTube, also Cypher of Tear. But that's it. I'm excited. I can't wait to go play the game myself. So go back it. Give us money so we can get you a game. Awesome uh and and also give uh praise and thanks uh to tanya and also th give it to the uh writers again because they worked real hard uh on a uh weird development cycle uh yeah 
Uh, I'm uh, Shido Mikota, they, them. Uh, I write and develop a bunch of uh, RPGs and queer speculative fiction, like just, yeah. Uh, I'm not really on Twitter anymore um, or, or TikTok. Twitter is because, bleh, TikTok is because uh, making content takes a lot of time <laughs> and I don't have a lot of time. Um, I have a Tumblr uh, that's just uh, Hiro Mikoda, my name. Um, uh, Hiromikoda.com is my website. Sometimes I update it with uh, the ridiculous number of projects that I have in progress. I, I would like to specifically highlights uh the uh snohomish tribe because i'm living on their ancestral land uh and a bunch of people who are not from the snohomish tribe are living on their ancestral land and that sucks and we should give them money uh so if you are also living on snohomish land or if you are living on any uh indigenous cultures uh and ancestral land uh you should give them money uh uh, especially if you live in Seattle because the Duwamish tribe uh, still doesn't have federal recognition, which just is bonkers and annoys the crap out of me. Uh, they they deserve it. They deserve way better than they've gotten. Uh, that's, that's my indigenous people's rant because I can't go anywhere <laughs> without talking about indigenous peoples because we... Uh, Regardless of which continent we're on, not generally cheated well. <laughs> uh, and with that bright note, uh, we'll, we'll see you somewhere in the near future. Uh, oh, wait, I actually I actually did have a commercial thing to plug. Uh, Pugmire, second edition, Realms of Pugmire, where you can be uh, the best dog possible in a setting that is not D&D, but looks kind of like it uh but through a really interesting lens uh that that kickstarter is same basic time uh possibly overlapping 100% uh we'll we'll find out soon uh but i i wrote the adventure for that uh i wrote most of the magic system which uh th thankfully did not have to get rewritten a ton thanks to the OGL problem, because I had already rewritten a lot of the SRD stuff away uh, and made it uh, more flexible, less punishing to people who want to play utility casters uh, and all that good stuff. Uh, so go back that. Also go back fifth season. There's probably other cool stuff to back. Uh, find it and do that. Uh, <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll catch you later. Uh, stay safe. <laughs> all right. Bye, y'all.